2018 will please come to order and the clerk will call the roll. Calling the roll, Mr. Miller. Here. Mr. Jones. <coughs> Excuse me. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones is absent at the moment. Mr. Shrine. Here. Mr. Tuma. Here. Mr. Gallagher. Here. Uh, Ms. Simon. Here. Ms. Brown. Ms. Brown is absent at the moment. We have a quorum. Let the record reflect that Councilwoman Baker is in attendance. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for being here. And the next item on the agenda is public comment related to the agenda. Do we have anybody signed in? No one has signed in. Thank you. We'll go on to item number four, approval of the minutes from the January 29th, 2018 meeting. Those minutes are in your packets. Would anyone like to offer a motion? Make a motion. For approval. Is there a second? Second. It's been uh, moved by Tuma and seconded by Sean. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. And the ayes have it. it. The minutes from January 29th are approved. Legislative matters referred to the committee are none. We have two discussion items. The first discussion item is the continuation of the uh, quarterly discussion on the ERP project. And before we start the continuation, I would like to uh, put forward a uh, tentative date. I'm going to wait just a minute and let uh, uh, this Brown check her schedule as well. Calling the roll for uh, Councilwoman Brown. Thank you. And uh, we were just getting ready to resume on the ERP project, and, uh, and I came up with a date of Monday, April the 16th at, at 1 o'clock. That's a regular committee time for our next quarterly update on the ERP project. I would ask if any of my colleagues or, or the administration know of a problem with that date. I, I will be out of town, unfortunately, but don't, don't, don't hold up to me. Uh, is the is the 23rd better? Better for me, but that don't again don't plan it around is, my schedule. Okay, uh, <laughs> you're an important player on ERP, so we like to get get you on board if we can. We're asking about the 23rd. Are there any conflicts on April 23rd? April 23rd is looking better. So uh, uh, Councilman Sean is accommodated, and we're going with the 23rd. OK. Uh, and uh, OK. okay. And uh, at the last meeting, we, uh, we heard from uh, we heard from finance, we heard from human resources, uh, we heard from public works uh, about their efforts to prepare for the go live on the ERP in their various areas of operation. And uh, now Ms. Nappy is going to give us the uh, technical overview of the system and the implementation process. Please proceed. Thank you, Councilman Miller. Uh, before I start, are there any follow-up questions for any of the steering team members or the business leaders who presented uh, two weeks ago? Yep. Okay. We don't he hear any right now, but if, if we do, when we get to the main question and answer period, we can do those as well. Uh, they're all here, so I will definitely be calling on them if there are any questions that you may have that would relate to their piece of the pr uh, presentation or anything that I'm going to update you on today. Okay, thank you. All right. So one of the things that we were asked for in the last uh, quarterly update was to actually come and show exactly how this project is being implemented and what exactly this team is doing. And this team is actually comprised of uh, core team members from all of the business teams you heard from last time, 
Department of Public Works, Fiscal and Procurement, Human Resources, and IT. So instead of just showing you and walking you through what a plan uh, looks like, which was our original intent, what we've done here is really basically told you what are the activities that these team members, these core team members, have been doing and performing since we initiated this, meeting, uh, this project. So on slide 38, if I can draw your attention to slide 38, when we talk about plan, many of you may already know what planning process means, but truly that is focusing on how are we going to implement this, what is this, uh, this project, what is our timeline, what are our resource loads, et cetera. So from that planning phase, we actually moved right into our design phase. And our design phase, as we illustrated last um, meeting, was focused on what do we do today? That we called our BPP, brown paper process. And as you can see, literally, we had brown paper on the walls and uh, sticky notes. And we brought in the people who are actually transacting work today the, the, not the supervisors, the managers, the people who are, are creating and doing the work today um, to understand what, how does the county process business day to day. And this BPP process was utilized, is being utilized for every piece and component uh, module that's being implemented under the ERP. In addition to a, does a BPP under design, that brown paper process turns into a process model. That is the middle picture right there that truly depicts inputs, outputs, um, Q and A, uh, all types of activities that that brown paper activity translated into a process flow. So we have documented process flows on everything that's happening today. And that was our basis point for informing Infor, our consultant team, on what is it that the county does? What do we need to transact business? And then what we turn that into, what Infor team turns that into is what's called 2B, and that last process diagram that you see under the design phase is truly showing an older process, going from old into the new process. So the, with the expectation of fewer steps, or perhaps if we were missing any types of steps, uh, added steps where we needed them, but truly to reduce, streamline, use the application that we've uh, purchased from the best business practices involved to streamline and create our, our environment here. And then the, with that step, once all of those activities were done, the next step was to move into the build phase, which is basically looking at all of that, those new to be uh, process flows and creating a conference room pilot to walk our business and technical teams through. And that conference room pilot is basically the design of the um, ERP module based on the business team decisions and learnings uh, through that uh, BPP and 2B process steps. And that turns into what you see under the build phase, which is a configuration within the N4 module of what our, our business folks and people who are going to be transacting business in the ERP will see. Any questions on that process? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Councilman Trotten. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, if I'm understanding the flow chart, we went through the brown paper process, uh, we went to the 2B, we went from the old into the new. Can you provide us with all those drawings and diagrams for that flow chart for the new? Absolutely. Uh, for one of these? So we should see a bubble chart that would look like something on the right-hand side. Uh, is, that, is that a correct you, understanding? You'll see two, two separate charts. You'll see the current state through that brown paper process, the one in the middle, and then you'll see the 2B process flow that's on the right, but a little more descriptive there. Yeah, the so yes, says, you'll see both. The one, that's, uh, the one that says new. I, I'm really... Yes. Uh, trying to focus on if we went from the brown paper process to the new, and you show, I don't know, roughly, what, 12, 15 bubbles on the old, and we're now down to three, if I'm just understanding Yeah, that's this. a sample. It's that's a, a sample. I understand right. it's a sample, right. but I, I assume it's a, it's a representative sample Correct. of what you've done in other areas. That that change should have resulted in forecasting those kind of changes that you're, sh you're showing in, in the new uh, three, three bubble drawing. It will help influence the uh, forecast change for each of the business teams moving forward. And that will help translate to, inform to them. money, activities, process, uh, 
and probably even people. It uh, could obtain to uh, obta uh, relate to any of those. I would think it would relate to all of those. Would be a, could re relate to any of them. Uh, I think it was Douglas. I don't know if I'll bring him up now. Who mentioned that, uh, Douglas? If you want to join us. With respect to HR, for example, that um, while they're learning and moving from the BPP current state to the two Bs, they may also be find, find out and identify items that they haven't done yet, that okay, they but, may need to do. But you've been part of this process and have heard me ask these questions, and I'm sure <laughs> others asking, where's the, where's the forecasted improvements, savings, dollars, as a result of this $25 plus million dollars, and I, I'm thrilled to see the new that should translate to goals and objectives and forecasting and dollars and people and, and all, all that new should be reflected someplace along the way in, in those things. Is it, it will certainly inform that whole process, yes. And have you set down what the impact, because nobody else up to here mm -hmm. has yet to take this microphone and tell us what the savings or dollars or benefits or time crunch is going to be on the new yet. Do you have that for us? We do not have that yet because, as uh, my colleague said behind us uh, last meeting, they, until they see it in actual uh, production and move through that first six months to one year of production, they may not know what that end result will look like. They still have to see this in production to really see where those components will change. And, and you've done this same process before many times, I assume, uh, and you have not done this with the expectation of seeing some new, when you get to that new, being a savings or a benefit to the organization. What have you historically seen when you do that? I, I, I love the graphics. I love the diagrams. Perfect. I just like to see how it translates into goals, objectives, uh, targets, dollars, all those things, and share with us what you have sure. done historically in the past when you get to that new bubble drawing like you have here. Certainly. So prior to the county, you want to know my experience yes. prior to that county. So when it comes to the 2B and the future state processes, Councilman Schron, that is the expectation, but each department that I've been involved with, each uh, company and each department who owns a component of the ERP transformation, identifies where they anticipate and how they want to uh, change and modify their departments based on the capabilities of the system. Some of them, I think we saw, uh, so from that perspective, some were more interested in timely processing versus uh, staff changes, the timely processing of removing roadblocks, removing cogs in the wheel with respect to visibility of how long it takes to process work. So if the process cogs in the wheels were, were removed through a workflow process, moving from paper to workflow, that showed visibility and it also allowed them to increase their productivity. So I saw a great deal of focus on productivity and from that, from a productivity perspective, a customer service base to improve the customer service base as well. So I've seen that quite a bit. Now when I've been with organizations, different types of organizations, when it comes to uh, staffing, each one had their own preferences. Some wanted to maintain that there would be no staffing changes. Others wanted to definitely indicate and show staffing changes. So I've seen an array of different components for this perspective. From, from an ERP implementation perspective. Okay, well, if you could please provide uh, our, our clerk with the, the old and the new, uh, yep. so we can be tracking uh, the new when we go forward. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, so our next slide takes us really into- Hold, hold on just a moment. Uh, Ms. Brown had a question on this slide, and, and so does Ms. Simon. Okay. So we'll, to Ms. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, part of it was asked and answered, and it was relative to the uh, process. If I, if I um, am understanding this chart, the, the, the diagram, the second diagram and the design phase was part of the Public Works Department. Um, presentation. Correct. Both of these were, if you see in the design phase, that is exactly what Mike, um, Mike Dever showed in his presentation as well. That's a real live from the county. Okay, and so to uh, Councilman Schron's point, the new would be um, very helpful. But I guess the question, the question that I have is, will we have that for HR and OBM as well? 
Correct. Yes. We'll have flow charts for each yeah, department. Flow, this flow chart process, current state, which is brown paper process, and the two Bs, future state, we will have them for every business area module that we're implementing. Okay. All right. Thank you. Lisa. Lisa. So what specific business um, models are you going to be implementing? And I'm sorry I missed last meeting. So can you be more specific on business models? Well, you said it. You said business models. So we are using, and, and the intent for the um, ERP project is to use uh, uh, basic business best practices that are built into the software. What departments are you referencing? For all of the departments that are we are implementing the ERP for. And so the core departments who are designing this, fiscal procurement, HR, payroll, um, and uh, public works. And how many um, paper bag process have you, or paper process, have you already undergone? Significant numbers under fiscal procurement. Uh, we have initiated and completed those for uh, the budget module, and we are going through the whole process right now with the HR components, and also with public works with respect to the EAM module. Okay, thank you. Councilman Tumor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Just along the lines of uh, Councilman Schron's uh, questioning, so um, you indicated sometimes it might not be uh, staffing or economics that is the savings in, in this instance. Um, so in the area of, of time, if a particular department is looking for time, I mean, can that be quantified? Do you guys have estimates as to what type of savings? Because from, from our end here, it seems like there's a lot going into this process, and we're not getting much back in the way of what the results will be. In, in so the metrics, so, what you're talking about, yeah. are the metrics. And so what we are looking at, so we are baselining now as we're, we've become very aware of the current states, we're baselining current state so that we have those to compare to once we are moved into production so that we can see the before and the after metrics. So does it, uh, a process take six weeks, and now it takes two. So those are what we're doing as part of this process. We're doing a lot of upfront work to okay. make and, certain and we'll we have will And will we be advised of those results as they Each Each of forward? these uh, gentlemen who owns uh, a big component of this will be identifying their metrics per their department, the before and the after. And I believe those will continue to be included as they rise in the ERP updates going okay. into production. Okay, I appreciate that's, that. That's exactly what you're looking for. We're just not there yet. Okay. But yes, we are We are going to baseline current compare to new. Okay, I okay. appreciate it. Thank you. Ms. Baker. Uh, the memo that we received from um, Department of Public Works does come out and say that when fully implemented, our internal goal is to see a 5 to 10% cost savings. And then they go on to say that a modest increase in workforce efficiency of 2 to 5% could result in savings of 200 to 530,000 a year, um, 428 to, to a million per year for the um, sanitary member uh, in their community. So, so there are some benchmarks that have already been um, forecasted with the limited new diagrams that you have. So I, I guess I would ask, how do we know this already? Um, and are, is this a conservative um, estimate? And do you foresee that uh, perhaps there'll be greater savings as you work through this um, program? Um, Michael Dever with Department of Public Works. Thanks, Councilwoman, for that question. Yes, and once again, we're trying to establish those baseline, those things that we can track in regards to our employees going out. And any given day, I have roughly um, 20 crews that are heading out throughout the county to do whatever work and mm -hmm. say it's flooding in someone's basement. We're benchmarking how much time it takes to do some respective it's, it's similar work each time they go out. Right. And does it take uh, 45 minutes? Does it take five hours to do uh, a simple snaking of a basement to open up so that you get the water down? But your, um, if I may enter, but your, your um, goal is based on the ERP efficiencies mm -hmm. 
from what it used to be to what it will be That's when right. this is fully or at least beginning to be implemented or when we go live is it, am i right on you're not just gauging what you are doing today but you're actually comparing what you did yesterday right. to what the ERP is going to allow you to do. That's right. That's right. Okay. Uh, information right now, it takes months to gather yeah. it, accum accumulate that information, and then to go through it and say, and look, at, we've got some inconsistencies going over here. Yeah. We're looking at, we're going to have real-time data. What's going on on any given day? Okay. And it's not just specific to the work crews. We have a very hard-working group of people that work for us, obviously. Yeah. But we have a fiduciary responsibility of those are the taxpayer dollars of each of those communities. Yeah. And we got to make sure we're, we're spending it correctly. Mm -hmm. So if, if we're not doing it correctly, you know, why are they utilizing us? Why aren't they going with a private company to do that work? Right. So I, that's where I see the benefit coming from this. Okay. That's helpful. Thanks. Councilman Gallagher. Mr. Dever, you, you oh, piqued my interest there with... We're going on a private property, snaking basements? Uh, in some of the uh, communities, yes, we do have agreements to go on. When there is flooding, there's an emergency situation. It's only in certain communities where we're doing that. Typically, our responsibility is within the right of way. Uh, from exactly. that, and we could talk later, but mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to find out the rationale, regardless of what agreement you have what right we have to go on a private property. Sure. I don't disagree with it. Right. I went through this, you know, 20 years ago. Right. But there's uh, many, uh, I, if we're not doing the work, the municipalities are doing it also with their labor force. Okay. And since we are an extension of their labor force <coughs> okay. through this agreement. So yeah, it's, you know, legally, I, I believe we're correct. Or I, I know we okay. are I'm, we're I'm covered sorry. in regards to that, but I'd love to talk well, with you. Don't run away. Yep. <laughs> Anything else for Mr. Deaver? Please proceed. All right. So the the next activities that we moved into we move into with these projects is testing, activating, and then production support. So we are currently in what's called the test phase for uh, a few of our modules, particularly uh, moving into testing with EAM and planning, and for testing with our fiscal and procurement mod, um, modules. What I have here, and I know it's challenging to see, but you can see that what we test, we're testing processes from the beginning to the end, so that we not just we're not just testing uh, a piece or a component of the process, but that we are end-to-end -end testing, and we are establishing what we expect, what's called our entrance criteria, exit criteria for testing, and what we expect to see, what that end result should be. Um, and so that our testers know if they don't get that exact end result, then we may have to, uh, a defect that we escalate through an issue and work through that and retest any type of issue that comes up during testing. So this is an example of a, a test model process for a particular test script. The uh, activation is really when we are focused on End user training, we are focused on implementation and go live planning, and then actually getting that approval to move forward. And I believe um, Mr. Uh, Di uh, Dykes in introduced last time that we are training what we call just in time. So our training is going to be staggered with each of the modules so that the training occurs very close to the time of implementation so that there is really a limited lag and our employees have not going to training and then the next week are using the product versus going to training in six months in the future going to use the product. So we're using that just-in-time model. And then, of course, activation or launch that I have here, that is the cutover into implementation. And that truly puts us into a production support model where we're supporting both the end users any type of issue that they may in, uh, incur, both on the application side and the technical side, and then our continuous development of that ERP as those modules go live. Ms. Nappy, have, have we uh, created a, a critical path analysis for each of, the, each of the go live processes so that we know what things have to happen in, in advance and, 
and when when they need to happen so that we can go live on schedule. So we have that in a our full project plan, and that is scheduled for each of the implementations. And we're doing that and performing that as we plan uh, that cutover activation uh, mapping. That's all occurring for each of the modules individually. Okay. So we have that in our plan. Okay. Thank you. Question. Ms. Baker. Uh, yes. Will there be a duo system, old and new, for a while? So that's a good question. We are saying, when, do, when can we sunset uh, our existing systems versus uh, the ERP? Right. So from the ERP perspective, we are converting data into, um, from our existing systems into the ERP. But once we do that, the intent is to limit the access to that other system so that it's view only in case there's a piece of history that somebody hasn't been converted for based on project decisions so that they still have access to view or extract data but that they're fully utilizing the ERP. I mean the goal is not to have um, two live systems so that the same transactions are being implemented into each of those systems. Yes please. So we will be implementing in two systems, but only review for one and live for the other. How well, we'll long? be live with ERP yes. and access to the old systems. So we won't be transacting in the old systems. The transactions will be um, certainly in the new system. And that's really for the core end users. So for example, uh, for our SAP core end users, they may need to review something from a historical perspective. Right. But new data will not be put into the old system. That is our full intent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Please proceed. Okay. And I'll just roughly uh, touch on this slide, slide uh, with the project structure and governance. I think we spoke about this uh, one of our second quarterly updates, but truly what you can see, we've continued to keep the governance process in play throughout the entire project. So we have both our INFOR team on the right here and our county team on the left so that we have um, not only uh, activities on both sides of the fence, but it's very collaborative. So for our project management team, project managers, project technical managers, directors, we also have our communications and uh, change management team. We also have our core project team. So you can see that these are really comprised of fiscal procurement, HR, Department of Public Works, and IT. We also have um, included other agencies based on the topic, based on the, the module going live, uh, as well as our core team members going through the process. We have core team meetings semi-monthly. We have uh, ERP steering team meetings weekly so that uh, we are certainly keeping on top of anything new or any issues and able to escalate those timely. There's change management on both the left-hand side and the right-hand side. How are those different from each other? So they actually are um, they're the joint team. So INFOR has their change management experts with respect to communications, training, and um, uh, just organizational structure. And they are certainly assisting our team. They're training our team and they're working hand in hand with our change management communications team to allow us to be in a position to replicate this process for other endeavors that the county may have in the future. Okay. Any other Continue. questions? Okay, great. So, hold on. Sorry. Councilman Tron. So, uh, in the way this slide lays out, it lays out the county's half of the obligation and INFOR as the consultant's half of the obligation. And it, included in there is the, uh, the layout and the scheduling and the work, uh, workflow of the product. If we went back to the RFQ, uh, would it show? all of this that you describe on the right-hand side coming from, from INFOR and your, uh, your, your proposal? Uh, that was from several years ago. So let me get back to you with that to see exactly what, if any, differences this shows. Okay. But as far as uh, project management directors, experts, that should all be there. But let us get back to you to confirm. Okay. And then when you get back to me on that, 
could you make sure that you've got your, your calendar and schedule forecasted activities to do these things from the RFQ and then the actual delivery that we're, we're doing right now and see how those two map up. I'm sure you had a timeline in your, uh, your proposal and it had an expectation of days and dollars uh, and uh, let's map it to where we currently are with dollars and days uh, as to the delivery of this project. Thank you. Uh, Councilman, could you say again what those two things are that you asked for at the end? Well, there's going to be, on, the, on the, the proposal, there would have been an RFQ that would have responded and said, this is what we're going to do, and it would have come from INFOR, and it would have had a dollar's amount, and would have had a days to deliver. I'd like to now map up the current days of where we are on this, this slide that we were, were just being shown, and how does that map up against what we said? What we were told when we bought this product from these consultants. Okay, thanks. It should, you know, it's dollars and time were the, were the quote, and dollars and time are what we're, we're receiving right now. Okay, fine. Thank you. Another question? Please proceed. So, what I also show on the next few slides are just samples for you of our, um, our meetings. So, we have a steering team meeting. Weekly, we have semi-monthly core team meetings, and that's with all of the business teams meeting together, finance, procurement, HR, um, e, uh, public works, and IT. And uh, we also have a, a standing agenda so that we are looking at this project in total. This is our, our standing agenda. You can see we're, we all talk about risks, issues, department updates, change updates, training. We look at the whole scope of the project with respect to covering the updates um, collectively for the entire team. And then we also have... I'm, I'm sorry, I, I hate to sure. be best, but let's go back to your agenda. Sure. Uh, I, don't see, I don't see delivery dates on there as being up, uh, up there. Is, is, that, is that being covered? If that's your standing agenda, I would think the timeline and scheduled activities would be an item that would be on your standing agenda, how do we look against yes. our benchmark? Yes, you, and you'll see that in a few slides. So we look at what is due this week, what may be overdue, what's due next week, et cetera. So uh, under each of these items, but I will show you in a, a few slides. Okay, and then how me. about um, the back to uh, Mr. Tuma's question, where are the metrics? Uh, is that not a standing agenda item either? As far as the metrics? Yeah, for that, I would think that Metrics, if that if we're looking to establish metrics for these activities, mm -hmm. why wouldn't that be a standing agenda item also? So those may just be captured under the status updates and what the departments are doing as part of the part department activities, but I could certainly make a note of that I mean, if that's, you would like us to, to start showing those. Well, what I'd like to do is to make sure the county is going to get the benefit for their bargain, and that's metrics. Mm -hmm. I agree. All right, we also have for each of the, the team members on the core team uh, issue risk identification escalation process so that we really have first level, second level, third level of contact depending upon whatever the issue is. Many times it's able to be resolved at the first level uh, or second level. Anything that cannot be resolved there is taken to the third level, the uh, executive steering team. And what I'm showing you on slide 43, this is an example of a team status update. This was taken from our uh, a team update for the payroll uh, portion of the project last month. So you can tell what they have accomplished. Many of those are, you can see the reference to the two Bs. They were uh, in the process of completing those. And uh, time collection, current state was also in process. And then what their next steps and activities were, which is coming directly from the project plan, what is the next step, what were the next steps for payroll at that time? And at that time, uh, on the 18th, they did not have any um, new or residual issues or risks. And then on slide 44, this is an example of the status update provided on the 18th of January by the change management team so that you can see they're talking about their tasks on the, on the left-hand side. What are their major tasks? What are they working on? Where are they in the progress? And then also the key updates to any of those details. They also would be providing any new issues uh, or risks and their mitigation plans if they had any at that time.
And then in addition to the core team meeting, which is everyone all together, we also have weekly work stream meetings. And the work stream process is to allow the finance and procurement team to focus on their activities, what is specific to um, fiscal and procurement, both technical and business-wise. Same thing for HR, same thing for public works. And this is also an example of what does a, a, an agenda look like for the, uh, the fiscal and procurement team. And one of the updates, this is also an example, this is a work, weekly work stream item on slide 46 that shows the conversion activities that are reviewed uh, during that weekly um, work stream meeting with fiscal and procurement to see where each of these components is. Percentage complete, um, dates, you can see the date tracking, and targeted completion date at the bottom. Those, those colorful diamonds are, are, are those who's involved in that particular Correct. element. And what's the difference between county and ERP? So the county may be the, um, the business team. The ERP is more of the, um, the project team through the Center of Excellence. And then INFOR is our consultant team. And why do some items not have any diamonds? It just depends. Uh, some of those are the, if you have the extract, for example, the second column where all of those are, are at rest, um, the next column, the third column, is just an update on those items. So it's not necessary to repeat some of those diamonds based on the, the column header. That answer wasn't clear. Let's try that again. OK. Uh, so let's look at column two, where we can see who is working on the extract requirements. We see for a majority of those, both the county, the ERP team, and INFOR are working on those items. And on uh, January 31st, on this column three, you can see the data extract code written. Uh, That's a percentage of time, not necessarily uh, who is working on that. We already see in column two who's working on that component. Mm -hmm. So we didn't need to repeat that, the color coding in column three. So in column three, is that the percentage that's completed? For those particular items, yes, on the conversion item at that time. And uh, how could outstanding checks be at 67% on 126 and at 66% on 131? So what we're doing is from, from an iterative process, we are doing and working on phase one activities for fiscal and procurement and on phase two activities for fiscal and procurement. I can get you the answer, specific answer to that, Councilman Miller, but I, I can't speak to that today. Well, what I'm, I think I'm misunderstanding something. If you could put that back on the screen. Is it not, it's not there? Oh, here we go. Okay. Uh, you can see it. I thought that column three was just an extension of column two, and, and so that uh, everything in column three should be uh, at least as much as column two and maybe more, but apparently not, because oh. under projects and grants, it's 50% in uh, column two and it's 0% in column three, so. Well, so that's a good, let me, let me explain that to you. So let's look at uh, this column two data extraction requirements to your first question, outstanding checks. We're showing that the, the requirements, the business requirements for data that needs to be extracted from current systems, they've completed 67% of those requirements. Now, what has to happen for that third column, the data extraction code written, that is going to lag behind the requirements. So the requirements have to be known, then the coding is built. So being actually just 1% off is actually pretty darn close. Usually we may see it definitely uh, a lower percentage. Mm -hmm. And okay. then also you can see this same um, explanation for projects and grants, the next row down. Extraction are the business requirements of what data has to be extracted from current systems. Those requirement gathering was at 50% for that conversion. And yet you can see in column three that the code had not yet initiated for that activity. 
writing of the extract program. So there's identification and then creating a program to, re to extract the data. Okay, thank you. Does that help? Yes. If it's too technical, let me know. It looks like things are not totally on track because on, for example, the uh, in the first column, or the second column, the target completion date was 126 and only 77% is completed. That is because some of these items where they are at 2%, those are not going live in phase one for fiscal, but yeah. rather phase two. So all of the phase one. What we don't do here is identify phase one and phase two, but we will change that going forward so that you can see for phase one and feel that, that comfort level of what's done for phase one and what's done for phase two that comes at a later date. Okay, thank you. All right. So also the, on slide 47 is also a work stream activity showing all the deliverable documents. Those are the documents that Infor Consulting creates. As we move through this process, these are, these are to approve our BPP, our current states, our future states, the conference room pilot, and also anything resulting or anything related to interfaces, conversion activities, uh, communications activities with respect to each work, work stream. So this, um, this is an actual in excerpt from the, um, I believe it's the fiscal uh, one of the more recent fiscal procurement work stream meetings. And then from the steering team perspective, that team does work, uh, meet every week. That is Douglas Dykes, Mike Dever, Scott Rourke, Dennis Kennedy. Uh, it's been Matt Carroll and Sharon Jubeldort, um, Sobel Jordan, uh, as well as the project managers and the INFOR leadership as well. And we have, uh, depending upon any issues or project-related activities that need to be escalated, this is an example of one of our recent um, agendas, but that agenda actually will fluctuate for certain things based on need at that point in time. Okay. And then what uh, we were also asked, what are the overall issues and opportunities that we're seeing and experiencing thus far at this point in the project? And perhaps what we've been seeing uh, from the initiation. And first bullet item that we have here is really competing priorities. These are certainly project teams. These project team members from each of the business areas and IT are folks who also have their regular jobs. They're being assigned a percentage of their time to really focus on this. But there's also other activities and other um, priorities that happen within their departments. So year end, right, quarter end, open enrollment, all of these types of activities are also occurring simultaneous with this project. So we wanted you to have that awareness. Turnaround time for key deliverable decisions, uh, key decisions and deliverables. Uh, we are taking our time to really understand what those deliverables mean, what that future state will mean to us, not just in the system, but what does it mean to our processes, our procedures, and our training. So we're taking a little bit longer to dive in, understand them, um, and, uh, and uh, approve them. And then sometimes uh, you know, we're better at it than others, but again, some of these documents are very lengthy and takes quite a bit of time to go through. We also are having a challenge attracting experienced ERP talent at this point in time. It is definitely uh, a point of, of concern based on the fact that we are moving into production and our intent to have at least abiding by the, the 15 hold, at least through May, uh, for staffing. We are still trying to um, pull in uh, some talent, attract that talent here. And then the last one is truly the magnitude of this change is not just a system. It is on every potential process that we're doing from a core department perspective. It's a, a different uh, look, a different feel, different process. And the visibility that this is going to bring across the county is certainly um, 
significant enough to uh, to merit time and addressing that through communications and change management. So, so we'll go to Councilman Schmack first. Um, when did you win this contract? This contract uh, was executed in October. Could, of, if you could beat the slider, please. Sure. Is it? Um, I don't control that camera. Oh, That's okay. That, okay. Whoever's control. Thanks. All That's right. It. There you go. Yeah. So, contract was awarded in October of 2016. Okay. So, October 2016, we're coming up a year and a half. Uh, were any of these items of on this slide not known to you at the time or I'm, anticipated in any in your prior uh, engagements? I mean, these are not... Sure. Nothing on this slide is something I haven't seen, and I'm sure everybody has seen on every single ERP. What were we doing 18 months ago to identify these these right here? I mean, obviously, ERP talent is not a it's not a new problem. It's a problem that's existed in every organization. Decisions on deliverables. Uh, I'm sure you've been through this. I don't know how many times you've done government contracts uh, where this, I thought you, this was one of your areas of expertise. Correct. So City of this Chicago. was an area, uh, and uh, the magnitude of these changes w had to be an expectation. So what were we doing on every one of these things 18 months ago? Doing what, improving and, and working each of these items. They still are um, impacting this team just as they've impacted every team that I've worked on previously. The difference here is I have not had such a challenge of, of identifying and bringing in ERP talented folks. This has taken much longer than any other experience that I've personally had with any other environment. So this one's much more elongated than, than what I have experienced. But these are common to every project, but we certainly keep those in front of the CIRIC team and I'm going to make you aware of those as well. And an alternative to bringing on experience talent in 18 months is to train talent with your existing workforce. And we're not, you're telling me that, or you're telling this body that we have not either done that or they're not capable of learning because uh, we need to buy talent from outside. So we have uh, had internal talent uh, apply for some of the roles. And we have internal talent, particularly on the infrastructure side, the networking side, fully engaged in this as well. But we are still having a challenge in staffing certain particular positions. Okay. And I, I hate to say it, but it, 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 are we being teed up for these being used as rationale for if, if we should miss deliveries or miss uh, hitting, of course, we, we don't even know goals and objectives. We're, we're still waiting to hear those, um, that we're, we're going to see some oopses uh, along the way that these four are going to get raised in six months or a year from now if we have slippage of any dates or deliveries or promises of, um, on, on the pricing of the product. I think that these are awareness components, and anything could change for any project at this time. Testing results may not garner what we want, et cetera. Those are the types of things that I typically see having more right. of an impact on, on uh, to answer your question, uh, versus uh, some of these components. Yeah, these are these are internal to almost every organization. Every one of these things, competing priorities, turnaround decisions, attracting talent. I mean that. Nothing on this list is not something that every organization inside or out of here doesn't experience. And, and we're no different. We are, we are experiencing those as well. Okay, Ms. Simon. Thank you. Can you be specific why you are experiencing more of a challenge to attract ERP talent here versus where you've worked before? Sure, I'm going to bring... Um, Director Dykes up here. Uh, we've been working directly with his team and really trying to get these folks on board. Um, Douglas Dykes, um, Human Resource Director. The issue is we can't pay. Hmm. Okay, that's really the bigger issue. We we've made three or four offers, and um, one of the candidates, um, one of the consultants, actually offered them quite a lot more. And they went there, and the others just said they can't come for that amount of money. 
So for 18 months, we've not been able to recruit people within our, our range of salary. Are you you're trying that's to? Not, that's that's not what we said. We said we're okay, having trouble. We're having trouble attracting some. We have recruited some people here, uh -huh. and there and I can't remember how many there are. Seven. So we have seven already. Yeah, and but how there many are. More, how many more are you looking to bring on? So we need a, a minimum of eight. An additional eight. So we're, we're getting to that slide shortly, um, but yes, we'll show you the staffing. So in a, we're abiding by the 15 cap that the council had asked us to work on, at least through, the, through May of this year, and then that means an additional eight individuals. And then by the end of this year, between Q3 uh, and 4, we anticipate another t uh, two to four. So you're going to have a slide on the 15 yes, cap? Yes, okay. we do. All right. So, so um, are we going nationwide to search? What are we doing for for ERP talent? Before yes, we're we're doing nationwide. We are looking at special interest groups. We're reaching into other organizations. We're actually doing some sourcing. Um, we're we're doing the gamma of it. Okay. So I'd like to see. Um, about who actually wanted the job and declined because of the salary. Okay. Can you provide that? Sure. How many people have actually answered and, and what the issues were? Absolutely. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the snappy. So I'm gathering that the uh, limits limitation on staffing level that the council placed in the budget is not providing any constraint whatsoever at this time. It's, it more relates to ability to attract people at the available resources. Is that correct? At this time, that's one of them. Okay. And uh, are, you, are you aware at this time of any... Uh, specific implementation problems that uh, create risks as far as our go-live dates? So we're moving into the testing process. And testing, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, is always uh, the most critical step. And those testing results are you know, could be very positive. Um, we may have some defects that we have to resolve, but none that we are aware of right now, but we do are, are moving into the testing cycle. So that is uh, of note. Please proceed. Okay. The next slide is just a culmination of what you saw individually through Director Dykes, um, Director Dover, and Director Kennedy's uh, presentation a week ago. This is just uh, an overview of each of the the components and modules going live. And uh, I would like for you to send us a version of this in in another format, if you would. Just just a list that lists. Uh, each of the go live implementations and the date that it's supposed to take place in order by date, you know, such as uh, uh, Public Works Wave One, uh, Sewer Department, uh, April 1, 2018, and, and uh, uh, Public Works Wave Two, uh, this department, April 15th. Uh, uh, Human resources, this, this section, wave one, uh, May 1st. It just, just a simple okay. list of, of each of the go live dates so, so that we can track that. Okay. Oh, we will do. Yeah, oh. it'll be a simple schedule for right. you then. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So moving on to our, our budget and our budget uh, details. Um, I wanted to put out here and make you aware of what's different about our budget and what's changed. So from where we were in June of last year, September of last year, to where we are now, we certainly have seen and had more actuals, actual dollar values for some key estimates come in and come in lower. So certainly um, our original estimates we were very conservative on uh, based on some of the unknowns at that time. 
And then also when it comes to what else has changed from a staffing, and we just talked about that slower pace uh, of bringing on staff. So the compensation and benefit dollars originally estimated for those folks are certainly lower than we expect it to be right now. And then we're also adhering to that smaller staffing level of 15 through May of 2018. And then backfill, we utilize the term backfill, and that is what we had an actual conservative estimate, dollar estimate, uh, for need by the business or technology team to um, take on production responsibilities for those who may be involved in the project to a high percentage. That uh, estimate was much higher than what we're experiencing to date right now. And same thing with our third party assurance. Uh, the, um, the actual is coming in lower than budgeted. So each of these items uh, that we have uh, conservative estimates on and actuals are coming in lower, each of those excess dollars has been moved to the contingency bucket so that we could certainly, the contingency numbers so that we could um, know exactly what we had at any given time. And then the last bullet here is our, our consultant invoices. The flow of their invoicing and the activities has slowed to reflect the deliverable pace through 20, not just 2018, but into the beginning of 2019. So do we have a third party assurance contract in place at this time? We have selected a vendor and we're in the process of initiating negotiations with that vendor. So we don't have it in place at this time? Not at this moment. And do we know what the dollar amount is, or is that still under negotiation? That is still being negotiated. What's what's the max on that? Uh, we had estimated six hundred thousand, and it is uh, coming under slightly under that. Okay, so something under six hundred thousand. Okay. Yes. On the um, bullets of lower than budgeted on both bullet numbers th two and three move to contingency. Can you give us what that savings is? What type of contingency? I know we, I believe, spent that contingency early on, and uh, now it looks like we're moving money back into it. So what kind of dollars are we talking about that uh, we are saving from those? Sure, I, I can provide you follow-up with those exact dollar values. Do you so have an for, estimate? Or, uh, yes, yeah, so that is definitely... Um, as far as our backfill estimate, that is close to a million dollars. A million? Okay. And third-party assurance we're negotiating, so that will be uh, something between um, less than 600. So that should be okay. uh, a certain, I don't have the okay. dollar value so yet until we're done. So a million plus, 1.2 maybe. Okay. okay. I'd like to have those numbers. If you sure, provide we can provide It's on those. the list. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Ms. So I just want to be clear about the 15 staff level, member staff level. Um, we, How many have we hired and how have we posted for all 15? Yes. So if you can see, this is slide 54. I'm going slightly ahead. Um, so slide 54. So what we, who we hired in 26 and 2017, by the end of 2017, we had seven folks on board that's comprised of four systems analysts, one program manager, one technical manager, and one director. Now what we are looking and what we've been still, even in that time frame, trying to attract and hire are two security analysts for the applications, two integration specialists, and one data architect, as well as one system administrator. And then um, beyond that, we are also looking at two uh, support desk individuals. So between now and Q, end of Q2 to get us to that 15. Have you posted all of these positions? Yes, some of them multiple times. Which ones multiple times? So we, we posted most of them multiple times, um, and we're still posting. Uh, with the exception of the data architect, that one has just been posted or is in the process of being posted. That and then the support desks, which will come later, we will be um, we will be posting that at a later date as well. Sense to post these positions sooner since you're having trouble attracting talent. 
The, uh, the most, good question, the most experienced folks with the ERP are the six uh, that we're focused on for Q1 and 2 uh, this year. Uh, the other folks, um, it certainly would behoove us to do that if we, if we believe we need it. We don't believe we're going to need uh, to take as much time on the help desk uh, assistance as we have by getting the ERP talent. Okay, please proceed. Okay, let's go backwards. So back on, on slide 52, we ha had been asked to show a progression of where we are, where we started from 2016 to 2017, where we are and where we expect to be through 2018, where we expect to be through 2019, and the totals and where those dollar values come up by, by year. Um, it, from a reference point in, in response to Councilwoman Baker's earlier question with contingency, as we stood on the, the 29th, our contingency was at a value of 1.9 million. And we just spoke about what's changed there. So, and then we were, yes, sir. So uh, we had identified something between a million and a million two or so of, of where that contingency came from. Uh, where does the rest of the three quarters of a million come from to get to the 1.94? Yeah, I'm going to bring up uh, Scott Rourke to, to talk to you about that because I think there may have been some misunderstanding or misinterpretation of use of contingency because when it was discussed earlier, I think it was October timeframe uh, and September timeframe of approval to use some of the contingency, it didn't exhaust it, all uh -huh. of that contingency. Uh-huh, okay. So, Scott? Good afternoon, Scott Rourke, Director of IT. Uh, yes, uh, just as Cindy had mentioned, the, uh, uh, the contingency um, as you may recall, we started at about $4 million, and we knew we had a lot of assumptions. Um, many of our estimates, as we RFP things, the prices come in. Generally, they've come in lower than expected. So our contingency from uh, probably the biggest impact so far, other than the one she's mentioned, is that as the project moved into 2019, we did move some of the budget to cover um, our operating expenses, which were not originally planned. We kind of pushed it back and covered the budget for the staffing and the software and other services through 2019. So that did draw uh, against our contingency. However, we've never depleted uh, nor tried to propose uh, fully depleting the contingency budget. The, it does ebb and flow as our estimates come in. Our lowest so far has been, uh, even at a con conceptual level, it's, uh, it's been six, 700,000 is probably the lowest it's been. And as we continue to realize, and we, we do believe there's still opportunities as we RFP things for prices to come down low. So we are, we do expect ultimately to use all the contingency um, because we were anticipating um, there are some unknowns that we're still working through. Um, but we're very excited so far. We, our estimates have been generally trending downward. And we've been able to keep, uh, right now we've got almost $2 million in contingency, which we think is important to make sure that we can, we're well positioned to manage risks going forward and take advantage of any efficiency opportunities that present themselves in our much needed or critical functionality. Hmm. Currently, uh, the forecast for uh, 20 and 21 uh, show the system's operating costs uh, exceeding the known realizable savings available at that place and time. If, if that situation continues and there's contingency money left, would we consider using the contingency to bridge that gap? Absolutely. Okay. Um, further, we do, as mentioned here, I don't, should I jump ahead? <laughs> if I may jump ahead on this next slide that's in front of you here, we do have, as we do, as, as Cindy mentioned, we have ambitious goals to, as soon as possible, sunset existing systems. So like you've heard Cindy mention SAP, mm -hmm. um, we do have a data center, you may recall, down in Columbus. 
Um, we are working really hard. The, the quicker we can shut those down, the more we save those operating expenses for services. And so we've identified 1.5 million of recurring savings that as soon as we can switch to this new system, those costs will be foregone and then also uh, can be repurposed to support the ERP, the new ERP system going forward. Okay, thank you. Very good, thank you. Okay, we have Councilman Gallagher. Oh, okay. Okay, so, so I, I just wanted to be clear. I thought in committee we were told contingency was exhausted. Is that a misunderstanding or you changed course? That's what I remember. I believe that's a misunderstanding. That was never our intention to communicate that. Okay, so maybe during the committee hearing that was a mistake. Okay. I mean, I'm happy there's money, so I just wanted to be clear whether it was stated incorrectly or a misunderstanding. I'll go back and look. I'm glad there's money. I mean, that's that's a positive. Current estimate was six hundred to seven hundred thousand was the lowest projected number for the contingency. Correct. Yeah, but I, I, uh, but to that same trends. that same point, I thought we heard the contingency was going to be completely consumed um, before we got to the end of this project, and that's when we were be we were going to be using those for for headcount and activities of that nature. And if you're telling me that I misunderstood it, then there's at least two other, maybe three others. So maybe we all misunderstood it. Yeah. The the. I think the, mis, uh, the miscommunication is, uh, is a matter of timing. So transactionally, every, almost every week, our, our project budget evolves as we finish RFPs and the likes. And sometimes if our RFP comes in lower, let's say $100,000, that $100,000 goes to contingency. So contingency can ebb and flow. You know, we had a surprise. We need to spend something we didn't expect. We need to do $50,000 software module that we didn't anticipate. So it is rather dynamic. Whenever we do save money versus our estimates, it does go to contingency. So contingency can grow from week to week. Our intention was in the communication in, I believe, October, was that our, uh, as it relates to the project shifting into 2019, was that we would use our, much of our operating costs in 2019, and that would draw from contingency. At the time, at its lowest moment, that contingency has never gone below six, seven hundred thousand dollars at a, at a conceptual level. Obviously, we haven't gotten into 2019, so we're not really drawing on, on it. But at a model level, we are suggesting of using a significant portion of our originally four million dollar contingency to support the operations of the ERP in 19. We did never, we never tried to communicate or proposed or conceptualized drawing the contingency below that level. The, at the end of this project, however, when we do get into 2019, we will reassess and see what kind of buffer we have left. And then we, the best use, working closely with you, we hope to ascertain whether there's uses for it or, as some council have, have suggested, could we use that in the future if there's left over, could we use that to reduce operating needs going forward? So once we get to that point, we will certainly work with you to make a recommendation. It appears that there was some miscommunication, but if there's going to be miscommunication, it's the kind of miscommunication that you want, because we're in we're in a little better shape than we had anticipated. So that's a good thing. Yes. Yeah, so as as a reminder, as the slides indicate, we have a current contingency of two million, and we do not have a vision currently for any kind of risks or surprises that may draw against that. So we feel that that's a decent buffer for where we're at. That's good. Okay. I just ask. Uh, yes. Uh, Ms. Baker. Um, usually, um, from my experience with contingencies, is that you have a certain amount of money that's put aside for things that are unexpected. And then any savings that you might have are just just that. They're savings, and they're not... I don't, I've never heard of putting those savings into a contingency, that the contingency was defined at the time that we said we needed to put aside in case we had unexpected costs. So I'm, we don't really know then what our savings, or do we know what our savings are that are being transferred into the contingency fund so that we know the difference between what we thought we needed for contingency and then what we fed into that account because of costs that were lower, that our projections are different than what the real costs were. Um, do you, can you track that at all, or is that, I mean? Yes, the way we're, and you may recall that this is, uh, was originally a bonded project, so we look at it as a $25 million 
bonded project, and at the end we would maybe decertify it and figure out the disposition of those funds. Okay. So the um, we're working very closely. The business service, our business services team works very closely with OBM, and we are uh, continuing to improve our processes. So what we will do is we will have kind of what you have access to. We we can better communicate the movements from week to week on these items. It's okay. the reality is there's only 20 items on it. It's not. Um, uh, a lot of complexity, uh, yeah. but, but week, week to week what we'll do is we'll make sure that you're updated with, in that spreadsheet, all of the transitions going forward. Okay. Okay. Ms. Simon. How often um, you're working closely with OBM and with regard to the transfers to contingency and what's happening? Is, can I ask Fiscal or Maggie Keenan to, Ms. Keenan, would you mind if the, Chair doesn't mind about how the two departments are working together on this quickly. Hi, Maggie Keene and OBM. Um, so we are we separately track this budget, um, and they are meeting with our analyst who's assigned to IT every two weeks to talk about IT in general. So it's not always ERP, but they have those standing meetings. So you're tracking? Independently, the money flow. We track everything. Thank you. Uh, figure, <laughs> just be sure. Sorry. Thank you. Ms. Keenan, while you're here, uh, how, how long is your presentation on the 2017? Uh, it depends how many questions you have. I no, only, I'm just I, talking your presentation so, itself. No, I know. I mean, probably I could make it in a half an hour if you don't ask a lot of questions. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, we want to... Are the easy questions? We want to try to at least get through your presentation today. So, we're, okay. so we'll hope to call you back shortly. Okay. Okay, thank you. Hmm. We're almost there. Okay, so I would like to ask Ms. Nappy to uh, complete the remaining slides. We're, sure. we're pretty close. So we're, before we're we close. do the next round of questions. Yes, yes. All right, so the last slide um, that we're looking at is uh, what is expected at the Board of Reco Controls requests and what is coming your way are consulting services for the third party assurance, uh, a data mart um, for our, our um, historical data that's going to be extracted from the uh, legacy systems so that we can truly sunset them, and then an ongoing interaction and interface with the, inter uh, with the ERP and then for document storage. So those uh, last two here coming in and expected to come through on the second quarter of 2018. What are the dollar amounts on these items approximately? So with respect to uh, the data mart, uh, I'm sorry, the third party assurance, again, that is, will be likely below $600,000, sure, right. somewhere between five and $600,000. As far as the data mart and the historical data <coughs> is concerned, we're looking at close to uh, a combined effort of close to just over $600,000. And then for document storage on uh, the third item, it is um, close to $200,000. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a couple of additional general questions. Uh, I know that the ERP is going to be used for keeping a lot of performance data and, and, and tracking, tracking the effectiveness of, of, uh, uh, of uh, county work being done. And uh, my question is, uh, to what extent is the county council going to be allowed to have access to this performance data? We are just uh, right now getting ready to kick off that component of the project. We're starting to organize around it to, to identify all the owners. So I don't have that answer today, but at least, you know, certainly we want to know what, what do you need so that we can look at you, uh, what do you receive today, and, and go through that current state to future state with you. Okay, well, our, uh, our request is to have access to this data. Uh, during the prior administration, they, uh, they, they, 
the uh, Fitzgerald administration ran a performance monitoring system, but we were not given much access to it, and and uh, uh, we want that to be different. Uh, we uh, we. We approved investing $25 million in this project, and, and uh, we want to be able to use the data. Thank you for that feedback. OK. Uh, another question is, uh, is regarding the, uh, the system security. Are, are we going to control our own system security, or or is Infor going to be involved in that? And if so, what's going to be the relationship between us and them around system security? So there's multiple types of security. Are you speaking about asking about end user security, end user access and security? Yes. Okay, so end user access and security are items that we will be establishing and setting up by the guidelines and guidance from the business teams as to who can have access to what component of information. And so our team, internal um, support team, will be trained on how to create those security uh, components and categories and how to assign secure it rolls by security level to each of the end users so there's certainly that end user access that we will have the ability to support internally and who's going to manage uh, uh, technical security like uh, preventing breaches from outside hackers and that kind of thing so that's a combination of amazon web services info and our internal security division any other questions? OK. Uh, I anticipate that we're going to have another meeting two weeks from today. And at, the, and at that time, I would just like to have uh, all the information that we requested uh, prior to that time and, and have you come back briefly, not to make any additional presentation, but just to, uh, to see if there's any questions, questions about the information, that, the follow-up information. If okay. That, okay. Happy, happy to come back. So we'll get the follow-up questions confirmed and get the answers ahead of that time. And we'll be here for any questions. Great. Okay. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you all very much. Okay. Thanks. That was uh, a lot of presentation. We appreciate the effort that went into that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, we have the uh, the twenty seventeen year end report. And uh, and 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 if it if it is okay with my colleagues, what I'd like is is for Miss Keenan to. Uh, to present the full report so that we at least get the information out on the table, and then uh, then we'll see. Uh, we'll start on the questions, and I I anticipate that we'll have to uh, come back in two weeks and and uh, complete the question process. Is that okay with everybody? What? Okay. Okay. You what? I said I'm not coming back, but it was a joke. Oh. <laughs> She does well under these circumstances. Uh, was it? You do well under, under, <laughs> under questions or waiting for questions. Do you do further that? questions? Thanks. And uh, I haven't seen this presentation. Are, are you going to send it to us? I will. Yeah. So I had to um, finish up some details this morning mm -hmm. because I didn't have access over the weekend. Um, okay. So I'll, I'll send it out. And I also want to note, oh, 
that um, we did the reconciliation since when I sent the report to you guys. So I'm going to send a revised report because some of the numbers have changed very slightly. Uh -huh. It's nothing material, but just so you'll see it. Otherwise, it's inconsistent if you look from the PowerPoint to the report. Okay, fine. Okay, so um, I have this set up. It's the same as everything I always do. We'll start with the general fund. I'm only going to talk about the major funds. If you have questions, you can interrupt me. We can go to the end. Um, so starting with the general operating fund, this again excludes the quarter percent sales tax that was levied in 2007. In 2017, we ended it with an operating surplus of about $38 million. That means revenue exceeded expenditures by almost $38 million. A lot of this was due to, um, we had two large transfers that weren't anticipated in the budget. One was a $20 million refund of an advance that the general fund had made in 2016 to a Huntington uh, Park Garage project. And the other was the return of the capital dollars that were set aside for the ERP and the switch refresh. And I can talk about that later, but we didn't anticipate those dollars coming into the general fund. So our revenue was about 47 million higher than we expected. 2017 revenue totaled $412 million, $412.7 million. Um, as I said, this was um, pretty significantly over budget, 14%. If you back out those two transfers, we were um, much closer to what we had anticipated in the budget and what we had been projecting all year long. 2017 expenses totaled $374.8 million. This includes the subsidies to other funds. Subsidies totaled $26.3 million. Um, overall, this was a budget variance of 4%. So we had surpluses in all the ending, all the budgets that are supported by the general fund at the end of the year, um, and combined they were four percent under. At the end of the year, we had a balance, cash balance in the general operating fund, about one hundred thirty-seven million dollars. That's thirty-seven percent of total expenditures. I do want to note that we have a reserve now on balance to complete the ERP and another IT project. So you should not look at this as money that we can spend right away. We need to set aside about um, almost $40 million for contract carryover, debt service, and those two projects. So looking closely at revenue, um, for the most part, revenue uh, came in what we were projecting all year long. There were no major surprises, um, with the exception of we did have a change in the other intergovernmental. That's the public defender revenue, and it was down because we only had 11 reimbursements in 2017. Um, so usually we get at least 12, but they were delayed in 2017. And the miscellaneous revenue was much higher than we expected again because of the 47 million in the cash transfers. Um, Sales, well, I'll talk more about sales tax later, but sales tax came in less than 1% variance from what we had been projecting all year, 3% uh, variance from budget, and that's largely due to the fact that when the budget was created, I had not um, taken out what's going to be deducted from sales tax for the debt service on the Huntington Park Garage project. We get reimbursed from the garage fund, but it comes into the general fund as miscellaneous revenue, not sales tax. Looking at expenses, um, like I said, we had a 4% budget surplus overall. For the most part, there was no one huge surplus that we had. We uh, spread out throughout all of the departments. The larger surpluses I have on the slide here, subsidies were under budget. That's largely due to debt service, mostly for gateway debt. So when we budget for the gateway debt, we tend to be very conservative, not anticipating a lot coming in from admissions taxes and other sources of revenue, which were higher than budget. So we had a decrease in what the general fund had to pay for debt service. Um, additionally, on the headquarters building, we allocate the cost of the space for the agencies that are in the headquarters building if they're not general funds so that we can alleviate the burden on the general fund. We had anticipated in the budget that this would come in as charges to the agencies and then revenue to the general fund. And what we did this year was just actually transfer the expenses. So it left a budget surplus. Same end at the end of the day, but we think this was a better way of going about it. Does anyone have questions about these specific surpluses, or should I keep going? Okay. 
I want to get put behind these people for the rest of my presentations. You're being awfully quiet. <laughs> okay, looking at the general operating fund overall, again, um, we ended the year with a $38 million surplus. If we back out those two revenue transfers that I mentioned, we would have ended the year with an operating shortfall, meaning expenses were greater than revenue, of about $9 million. We did have $10 million of carryover, contract carryover, coming into 2017. So if everything had acted as we expected in the budget, we should have anticipated a shortfall of $10 million. So we actually did a little bit better than we expected. Looking now at the quarter percent fund, this is a sub-fund in the general fund, but we do segregate it. It captures the expenses associated with the hotel, the Global Center for Health Innovation, and the Convention Center. And now it also includes debt service on um, the Q Arena project that we issued last year. So in 2017, revenue totaled $67 million. This was less than what was in the budget. Um, I'll explain it in a second. Expenditures totaled $49 million, which was also less than budgeted. Both of the variances can be attributed to the hotel debt. We had anticipated when the budget was set that the payments we get from the Hilton were going to come to the county, and then we would use that to offset what we pay the trustee for debt service. These payments went directly to the trustee. So it's no impact for us at the end of the day, but the revenue's down, and then what we paid in debt service was down because we had this revenue in the trustee. Ending cash balance in the quarter percent fund totaled about $44 million. This is almost 90% of total expenditures. This cash balance is included in the larger general fund, so we do have a council ordinance that says we need to maintain a 25% cash balance. This cash is included in that. Um, it's a large cash balance, but I do want to point out that this is our reserve for any capital needs and repairs at the hotel, the convention center, and the global center for health innovation. I have noted on here, and I discuss it in more detail in the report, that we do have some other reserve funds for the same purposes, um, but according to at least our asset manager, we're going to be short in the future years for the needs at the hotel. So this is something that we're going to want to look at in the next couple of years. The next slide is the general fund combined. So this is the same data that I previously talked about, but it includes general operating and quarter percent fund. At the end of the, um, 2017, we had a cash balance in the general fund of about $180 million, which is 43% of total expenditures. So we are in compliance with the code, ordinance, code, code requirement. Looking at sales tax, um, sales tax represents the largest source of revenue to the general operating fund and the quarter percent fund. In 2017, our sales tax totaled $265 million, roughly. It was 55% of total general fund revenue. Um, sales tax did go down from 2016. This is because we lost the Medicaid managed care sales tax in the end of 2017. Non-Medicaid managed care sales tax increased year over year 1.5% in 2017. 2018 budget anticipated a 2% increase over 17. Moving on to the levy fund, we have two voted levies in the county. They support um, social ser human and social services in our Department of Human Services, Juvenile Court, a couple of other agencies. In 2017, we brought in $234 million from the two levies combined. Total expenditures, 200 and almost $240 million. We had an ending cash balance in the levies of about $34 million, which is 14% of total expenditures. 2017 expenses were offset by cash in the pub combined public assistance funds, which decreases the levy burden. Um, in 2017, we had an operating surplus in the levies. I have to change this. We actually did not have an operating surplus, sorry. 
Um, in 2017, we drew down $11 million in cash in the combined public assistance funds. So that's important to know because when you're looking at our schedules and see that the levies are balanced or close to being balanced, you need to remember that we had this cash, which is covering expenses too. That cash is going to go away at the end of 2018, so we're going to need to make some adjustments in the levies in order to stay in balance. If we did not have the cash in the public assistance funds, we would have ended 2017 with an operating shortfall in the levies and a cash balance of about $22 million, which is 10% of total expenditures. And we do have another ordinance that requires a 10% balance in the levy fund. So we would have been in compliance, but just barely. Ending cash balance in the HHS levy and PA funds combined was $62 million. And like I said, we are drawing the majority of the public assistance dollars down in 2018. The all funds budget has all of the county's special revenue funds. It does not include grants and capital projects at this time. In 2017, we ended the year um, $1.5 billion in both revenue and expenditures. We were fairly close to budget. We had a 3% variance in the revenue budget. Um, I talk about the details in the written report. General fund was a large part of that because we had the $47 million in transfers in. Operating expenditures totaled $1.5 billion as well. We were $130 million under budget. Again, it's all in the report why we had such large variance. The majority of them were in the Public Works Department in the Road and Bridge and Sanitary Engineer. The next slide, just um, the staffing levels. The staffing levels haven't changed very much in the last couple of years. Went down a little bit in 2017. We are expecting to go up slightly in 2018. And then I have 18 and 2020 updates. Do you want me to pause for questions on 17 first? Sure. Questions about 2017. I have some questions about 2017. You said... You said that we have, after you've corrected for the $47 million in, in, in transfers, you said that we were, we had excess of expenditures over receipts of $9 million, but that we had a $10 million carryover, leaving a net of plus one. That's correct. But didn't we have some 2017 expenditures that got pushed into 2018? We, yes, we always do. So the carryover in 2018 was actually higher than last year. It was $13 million. So so it sounds like uh, the carryovers Actually, it's 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 uh, minus three. It and, and helped so, the picture that carryover increase in two thousand seventeen. And, and so you should add the minus three to the minus to to minus nine, and and it looks like that on a uh, on a structural basis, we we're actually twelve million short in twenty seventeen. Is 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 that a fair analysis, or am I missing something? Well, but keep in mind that there's cash in the fund to support that. So the 2017 or whatever year we want to talk about, 2018 budget, will assume that you'll spend this much, which we never do. There's carryover every year. We are hoping to decrease it. I don't know what happened in 2017, but um, it goes down. But there's cash there. So we usually will then underestimate the cash balance, too, for carryover. So when we did our projections all year and we're assuming, say, $10 million in carryover, it turns out to be $13 million. That means I would have then underestimated the cash balance, too. So there's cash in the fund to cover all those expenses. It doesn't mean that we're in trouble. It's not adding up. Because what you're saying is that... Uh, That we were nine million short in 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 twenty seventeen, mm -hmm. and let's just let's just simplify it. 
transfers coming in, uh, incumbences coming in from 2016 and to 2017, and and uh, incumbences going from 2017 to 2018. It's pretty close to a wash. Mm -hmm. It's $3 billion different. Yeah. To call, let's be generous. Let's call it zero. Mm -hmm. Well, we were $9 million short. We mm -hmm. had, we had uh, $9 million more in expenses than we had in income. Mm -hmm. That's, that should concern us, or am I missing That something? should concern you, yes. The okay. carryover okay. should not concern you. But we have a structural imbalance. We have for years. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, could you put up the slide about the, uh, for the health and human services levy? Okay, so for 2017, we had revenues of 234, and we had expenditures of 239, and we had drawdown on PA funds of how much in 2017? 11 million, 11.4. So we drew down on both balances. We so had to that draw means on the that on, on a structural basis, it was minus 16 or Correct. thereabouts. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's, uh, that's a concern. Okay, other questions? Councilman Schrein. Just because um, I know you were in the room when we were discussing the contingency on the ERP and the savings uh, going in there to have a, a, a dynamic account, I think was the word I, was, I think I, I heard. Uh, is that what you uh, did on construction projects around here uh, when we had uh, the contingency in regards to the hotel and uh, uh, the convention center and things of that nature? Do we use that same kind of technique as far as the contingency where we add and subtract and, and use those kind of things going back and forth? I don't know exactly what you're asking. The, Miss, uh, you, yeah. Uh, I, I, the question was asked uh, about the. We th I think Ms. Simon also raised it that we thought the contingency was going to get completely wiped out. We were right. And then we come in here and we say we're, we're told, oh no, it's uh, it looks like it's just short of two million dollars. Uh, and the answer was because it's a dynamic contingency account where if they received a savings from X contract uh, coming in lower, that they put that into the contingency versus uh, letting the contingency stand or fall on its own. Um, is that the normal practice? Because uh, you indicate you monitor uh, all the accounts, and so I, I didn't, I'm just trying to ask whether that's yeah. the normal way in which we use the same contingency calculations and accounting when we did the, when we had the, the millions of dollars left over from the Hilton Hotel that we were able to use. Right, so the, um, and I, I'll have to double check and get back to you for sure, but the Hilton contingency I don't believe changed. Um, so I don't think there was a lot of fluctuation in that number. The, at the end of the day, the hotel wasn't under budget by the amount of the contingency, so they did not spend that. I don't think it was a dynamic, um, but I'd have, to, I'd have to get back. I think what they're referring to is just the savings of the project. So it's a $25 million project. They had allocated... 23 million and then two in the contingency or whatever it was. So if they have savings in another area, I think that rightfully should go to an ultimate savings and they're just calling it the contingency fund. Okay. I, I don't did. think that's what we did with the hotel, but yeah, I, to be I, honest, I, the project was I, basically I was, done when I got here. Yeah, I was I was not aware of, it just seems to me the contingency is to take care of uh, uncertainties. Unanticipated. Mm -hmm. Yep, unanticipated activities. And, mm -hmm. and if there's savings, then thank goodness the con. The, the contract came in under low, uh, under budget on certain areas out there, but mm -hmm. uh, I was just trying to ask you because you said you were, you monitor their activity on a parallel basis. So I was just curious as to how you were treating those same savings uh, when you were monitoring it. We're we're not assuming there's going to be savings. 
I mean, we're monitoring it. We take the information that we're given, just because I tend to be very cynical by nature. I'm anticipating this is going to be at least a $25 million project. Which means the contingency is going to be consumed. That is personal opinion, just because I always assume the worst. Mm -hmm. That's part of my job, is to assume the worst. Yeah, I'm just trying to identify. <laughs> I think of a contingency as being related to the project. If there's some savings over here, it shouldn't artificially be be used, it seems to me, to uh, mm. to uh, uh, to cover for failures to estimate whatever the project was and the contingencies to cover it. I would agree with that. I think there are savings on the project. The general fund should get the benefit of those savings. That's exactly it's right. It's a general it fund project. Done. Right. Thank you. If we did the ERP project for $25 million, but there were no cost overrun. That would not be the worst. That would be... Uh, I agree. The, on a project like I this, agree. that would be kind of okay. Uh, Councilman Gallagher. Hi. Hi. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, not really looking for your opinion, but it would seem as though that we have enough in reserves to upfront the cost of a buyout. Do you agree with that? Um, so I can't remember offhand. I know Trevor did an analysis. I don't remember what the, the numbers cost I saw. The answer was. would be yes, but okay. I, I'm not forcing a yes on you. I'm just building a case here, brick by okay. brick. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. I know you are. So again, I'd have to look at the numbers because I didn't look that closely at what Trevor did. I would assume, just recalling the 2009 buyout, that we certainly have the money. I don't know how close we would dip to the 25% line if we're willing to go below the 25% because this is a one-time, you think you'll get savings. GFOA is 17%, so I would hope we wouldn't I, I know there's there's a lot, of, a lot of movement here, mm -hmm. but I'm noticing our personnel creeping up. Absolutely. Uh, actually, disturbingly. And, uh, you know, when I see that, because I remember when we first got here, how we, enact, we knocked it down and how difficult that was. And now it's strangely creeping up to those levels. And I've never been in the county where I've seen a buyout where we could upfront pay for it. I don't even know if that ever happened. But if we're in a position to do that, my... We paid for it in 2009. Did we? Absolutely. And we saved money, didn't we? Absolutely. How much did we save? Oh, oh, over three. I should have brought that. Why don't you, um, you ballpark it? And if it's more than one dollar, it makes it's my more than a dollar. Bigger. It's mm -hmm. more than a dollar. I I I would have to get back to on how much we saved, um, but I know if staffing levels stay down. So if you can intuitively, you know. it's it's not a difficult equation. Mm -hmm. But when you start going over what you should, you know. So thank you. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go on to twenty eighteen. Okay. So I just included a couple of updates. I think I actually included these in the January report that I had sent to council, but just wanted to make everyone aware that already, though it's early in the year, we do have some updates to what we had anticipated in the budget. For the most part, it's all good news. Um, so earlier this month, the county received an additional $6 million, like $6.2 million, I believe, from the state to transition us from the Medicaid managed care. We had already received 25 million. We knew that was coming, but in the um, latter part of 2017, they had approved this additional 6 million. So we already did receive that. That was not anticipated in the budget. It is in a special revenue fund, so if you wanna access that money, we would need to have council's permission to transfer it. So it's not reflected in the general fund. So for now, we're not gonna spend it. But That's it, correct. But it, it, uh, it gives us uh, some additional transitional assistance for the next round. Yes. Yeah, okay. And there's a possibility that we'll still earn some additional dollars later in the year, but that's much shot. left. Yeah, it's not as much of a sure thing as the six million. It would the be three to four three million, is that mm -hmm. Okay. The second one is our investment earnings. We are assuming now that those are going to increase by $2 million from what we had anticipated in the budget. There was a restructure of the portfolio at the end of last year. I don't fully understand everything that happened, but I know that our yield went from 1.4 to 1.7%, and that equates to $2 million, and that is a sure thing, so that's good news. And do we have any information on how much benefit we gained from the state legislation that, that allowed us to uh, uh, go to 10 years instead of five? 
I don't, but I can ask Joe Ferris about that, our investment manager. Okay. Fine. And then the last one, I just want to give a heads up. It's not concerning yet because it's still early in the year, but open enrollment, you know, the county's benefit open enrollment program is done after we submit the budget. Um, so this year, we make, you know, we make assumptions every year about participation and plan selection. And this year, the assumptions that we were given um, didn't quite pan out. We had a double the number of employees who chose the highest cost plan to the county. So our costs are increasing by about four and a half million dollars. Like I said, it's early in the year, so we're not recommending any change to the budget right now. Um, I think we can probably absorb it, but we will be seeing then in every agency budget where this cost is captured that they're going to be looking like they are over budget in the benefits line, and that's why. Okay. Questions? Do we know why people are um, staring upward with that? Um, this so is a contract. I can only speculate, but um, you know, this year in 2018, we did increase that. We got rid of um, we got rid of one of them, one of our medical mutual plan, I think, right? I don't. Oh gosh, who did we get rid of? United Healthcare. And so everyone had to go to medical mutual, and then we also increased the employee cost for the metro plans. So purely speculatively, I might say that the people who were enticed to come to Metro because it was free said, forget it. If I got to pay, I'll go back to my original doctor. Yeah. But that's, that's only my guess. That makes sense. Thank you. So uh, I sent you a question this yes. morning. Uh, and for the benefit of my colleagues, what, what the question was is, is that if you uh, if you take out all of the uh, fund transfers and one-time uh, accounting things that we can do to move money around and such things, and just look on an operating basis, the uh, receipts in expenditures out, uh, how far are we off on a structural basis from balancing the budget in 2020? So at the I'm sorry. At the time that the budget was adopted, we included a 2020 estimate, and at that time there was a 15 and a half million dollar operating shortfall. So revenue was less than expenses by 15 and a half million dollars. Included in our revenue estimates was a five and a half million dollar transfer from the quarter percent fund to the general operating fund. We've been doing that every year. We increased it in 2018 by a million dollars because the quarter percent fund has had an annual operating surplus, so revenue's been exceeding expenditures for several years. So we increased it to six and a half. Then we increased it by another million dollars in anticipation of there being a surplus at the CCCFDC. So I had discussed this when we did the budget. We give the we give the CCCFDC 5.4 million dollars a year for their operations if they operate under that. The, the surplus has been going to a capital fund, which is discussed in the report, um, but the capital fund we assumed is fully funded, and so the million dollars could come back to the general fund. What I forgot to put on here, but I just remembered, is we're taking a million dollars from the Certificate of Title Fund, which is the title office that the fiscal office runs. Um, that has a I've been operating with a pretty significant surplus for the last couple of years, and they have a healthy cash balance. But we likely would have recommended stopping that in 2020 anyway, because I think then you would have you're getting too close, where you need to make sure there's cash in that fund. So, um, and then we're taking in 2020 8.5 million dollars from the Medicaid Managed Care Transition Fund into the general fund. So, if you back out all of that revenue, which is the one-time and fund transfers, and then add in the million that I forgot to put in for the certificate of title, we would have an operating shortfall of 32 and a half million dollars. This uh, is, sorry, but I just want to say this is also based on the estimates for 2020 at the time that the budget was um, developed. So we were assuming the inflation of salary costs and benefits costs. It doesn't include any savings from ERP. It doesn't include staffing levels going down. So I would hope that the expenditure estimate is worst case scenario. I would, uh, I would subtract from that the five and a half million base number that we've been transferring out of the quarter percent sales tax every year. That seems to be pretty sustainable. 
That's pretty sustainable, but I would encourage you just to review the report that I submitted that talks about the shortfall in the capital fund for the Hilton. You did mention that, okay. but... Uh, it's a one-time, but there's going to be a major upgrade in, um, I think it's like 23 and 24 or something, when they redo the rooms. Okay. For now, we're going to use $27 million as, okay. as the number, so that's, uh, that's a concern. It's a concern. Although... Uh, we have uh, we have time to work on it. Yes, yes. I was just curious, what happened to the um, pedestrian bridge, ten million dollars? That was never funded. Um, so the county, again, this was before. I don't mean to make that as an excuse, but those conversations were all before me, so I'm not entirely sure what happened with it. But I know it was never funded. So when the county didn't proceed with the project, there was no money to take back. Okay. Can I follow up with that? Yes. Thanks for asking. Do we have to do, I guess, what do we do to decertify that or make it go away um, as There are no contracts. There's no contract. No, okay. now whether there's a commitment outstanding would be a question for the executive. Um, I can ask, or maybe Mike Dever would know. Am I correct? We did spend two or three million. At, two, uh, yeah, about two million dollars. Yes, for ex you know expenses that were incurred, but we didn't pre-fund the eight million. So even even if you were to liquidate a contract, it was never funded. Okay, Ms. Brown. Yes, a follow up of uh, Councilwoman Simon's question. So in the event that if it were to move forward, where would the funding come from then? Um, so we used the road and bridge fund for the $2 million that the expenses had been incurred. So I would lovingly offer up the road and bridge fund, but it would have to be either road and bridge or general fund. Mm -hmm. And either way, it would come from what's already been budgeted. So we have a CIP, the capital improvement plan that um, identifies expenses that are coming out of road and bridge for the next five years. And I think they are anticipating that they're going to be pretty much tapped out. I'm not sure that I agree wholeheartedly with that, but it would have to come from the existing cash balance. Mr. Chair? Yes. How about this infrastructure plan today we're supposed to hear about? <laughs> Sorry. I don't know what infrastructure plan you're talking Coming about. Coming at the top. 200 from the billion top. from the White House. Maybe oh, they, they can pay for the pedestrian bridge. 1.5 yeah, okay. from our press. Okay, thanks. I thought that was a serious question. <laughs> Any. Any other questions about the 2017 update? Okay, well, what I would like to do is uh, we, we, uh, we got the report fast, and, and the, uh, the report itself is going to be updated. And, and, uh, and I do want to come back in two weeks to make sure that we get all the information that we requested about the ERP project. So at the same time, we can have, have you come back and just see if after people have had a chance to sift through this, if there's, <laughs> if there's further questions. I'll send an updated report, if not today, then tomorrow, because it's just a few numbers That's great. that it changed. OK. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so we will we will meet again. Uh, hopefully, uh, a relatively short meeting because it's basically for uh, for follow up. Uh, I don't know that we have any legislation pending at tomorrow's council meeting, but if we do, we can hear that as well. So we will meet again in two weeks. Uh, is there any miscellaneous business? Hearing none, has anybody signed in for public comment? No, no one else has signed in. There being no further business that compels our attention, we stand adjourned. Thanks very much, everybody.